Hello, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm Dr. Christopher Nolikin. And I'm Dr. Lindsay Renzullo. We're happy to have you back. 2020. 2020, first uh, show of the year. Woo! Fabulous. I actually have a good feeling about this year. I feel like 2020, like even year numbers are good years. I don't know. it's 2020 vision. People keep using <laughs> yes. that analogy, which oh, is yes. driving me crazy. I haven't even heard that one yet. That's yeah. great. I like that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. But January is also a really fun month because it is National Blood Donor Month. Right. Now, blood donor, human blood donor, well, we presume. True. But also, we thought it would be a good opportunity to talk about pet blood donations and kind of pet, pet blood typing, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so why don't we, I don't know how to start with, well, let's I think talk with, it, start with dogs. Yeah. So I guess when we were thinking about this as a topic, we thought it'd be sort of interesting because... You know, one, we've never talked about it before. Right. We've never talked about blood donation. And then two, there are actually some cool similarities, but also differences between, you know, both felines, canines, and humans that kind of make it very interesting and cool. Mm-hmm. I don't know, just as a veterinarian. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's talking about with dogs, you know, we look at dogs. Dogs have, just like people, blood types. And cats. And cats. I guess we can just talk about let's, blood let's types. Talk, yeah, start. let's talk about blood types. So I think everybody's sort of familiar with the blood types and people, you know, you know that you're A or B or O Positive or negative, or, negative yeah. or, yeah. Yeah. And so based on the type of blood type that you are, it sort of determines what kind of blood you can, like who you can give your blood to and who you can receive blood from. And blood type really, it's, it's relating to different antigens and antibodies on your red blood cells mm-hmm. and what one person's going to react to versus another person. So, right. um, or I wish, shouldn't say people because we're not at all talking about people because no. I actually don't know most of blood transfusion medicine in people, but I do in no. animals. Yes. So let's talk about cats because I feel like cats in some ways, though, to just to start it, it's a little bit easier for easier. people to yeah. understand. Um, so cats have three main blood types. Yep. They have A, B, and they also have AB. And blood. AB is not really just a fundamental combination of the two, but it, no. it's its own separate blood type. Yep. Yeah. And majority of the kitties are actually type A blood. So you can get, you know, lucky saying, okay, well, a lot of cats are type A blood, but it's really, really important for feline patients to type them and cross match them and stuff before you're giving transfusions because these are the kind of cats that, or these are the type of patients that if they're receiving a blood that is not their type of blood, it actually can be extraordinarily disastrous. Right. Um, majority of the time, if you're giving a cat that is a type B blood, you're giving them type A blood, they can actually die if they right. receive that. The because they actually have antibodies against the opposite type. Even if they have never been exposed to that other type of blood, that's a little bit of a difference between cats and dogs. But cats, you just you have to type them. And most of them are going to turn out to be A. Mm-hmm. Most hospitals only carry A blood because B is super rare. It is. Especially here, regionally, I guess, West Coast there's it is a little true. higher population of the type B cats. Some of the more, the exotic breed cats, the cats that are a little bit more unique, not the classic domestic short hair, domestic long hair, those exotic type of breed cats, those are going to have sort of the, the, the B I type think blood. Abyssinians are the yep. most commonly type B. Um, so some hospitals like we have regionally, one of our hospitals carries, always carries at least one unit of type B blood. Most of the time we throw it out, but if we need it, we can ask for it. We can call them and say, hey, we need that unit of type B blood and it's available. Right. Because when we get units of blood and that's what we have to do, we end up getting you know blood from, from blood banks. Um, it's only good for a certain amount of time. I mean, right. Those red blood cells will degrade as time goes on. And so you know, we want to be able to stock them and have, them, have the, the things that we need in case any patient arises that requires it, but it only lasts for so long. It's like chicken. <laughs> Like <laughs> or cheese or chi- whatever you it can only bad. keep a unit of bread it's one month right yeah yeah so they have to be refrigerated and they just they're fresh for only so much time yeah Do you um, have a question yeah um is does is it healthy for a, a healthy dog a donor um to be giving blood like are there any side effects or downfalls of having a donor dog or cat yeah we can talk about that of having a donor or or being a recipient a donor yeah Being so a donor. if you have a healthy young yeah. dog or cat and you're like you know i they're really good getting blood mm-hmm. giving blood you yeah. know and you want to help are there any downsides to having a donor so i mean honestly there there are some certain requirements that are needed in order to have your pet be an acceptable donor if you would want your pet to be a donor um you know for cats a lot of times it's they've got to be you know indoor only normally they have to be above a certain weight we don't want the really super teeny tiny cats to donate blood um same thing with dogs they want to be not the teeny tiny dogs you want them to be like 50-ish pounds and above um 
you know, they need to be vaccinated, have no other medical issues, not on any other medications. Um, you know, they need to be healthy patients. But for the most part, no. I mean, if they kind of meet all the exclusion criteria, um, you can have your dog or cat uh, donate blood. Cat Dogs, for the most part, can donate without any sedation and they just sort of, you know, have no issues or problems. Maybe they're a little bit tender or sore where they've given the blood. Um, but cats, sometimes they'll sedate a kitty for a blood draw for the large amount of volume that you need for a blood donation, which isn't a crazy amount, but it's enough that, you know, maybe for a kitty, it just is a little bit more unnerving than for some Stressful, dogs. Yeah. 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 There's, there's rules. So you can only remove a certain percentage of an animal's body weight. And that's actually the biggest thing for why we have weight weight yes. limits is that you it just wasn't worthwhile to collect the amount of blood that you can collect on a 10 pound dog because you're only going to get you know five mls five cc's or, or whatever and that's just not worthwhile because then you what are you going to give that to you can't give that to a big dog you have you've only got a tiny little bit of blood so we generally are shooting for animals that are over i think 50 pounds yep. is usually the weight limit for dogs and for cats it's usually i think over 10 pounds yes. every every donation site would have their own separate requirements most of the testing that they require is mainly to ensure that the blood that they're giving is healthy right so Correct. you don't want to be transmitting diseases via the blood so when you're pulling blood from an animal you're just you're essentially simulating a blood loss event, which our bodies are capable of recovering from. You're removing enough blood that it's not going to cause any issues in the short term. Just like people, we we donate right. blood and they give us a cookie, <laughs> you know, Some juice. and make us sit there for a minute just to make sure we're not lightheaded at all. But then our body compensates for that in the short term by just reducing our kind of amount of blood that we need temporarily, maybe pumping up our heart rate for a little bit. And then Your over... Your spleen can contract, which yeah. is a great way to kind of release a little bit extra blood. Exactly. And then over a period of time, over about six weeks, we replace all those blood cells. So we do our natural production of blood cells and it just goes a little bit into overdrive. So there's no long-term effects negative mm -mm. for that. Yeah. And some patients, I mean, even for some cats, some cats... Um, you know, or different veterinary hospitals or places will actually have like donor cats that are sort of like these in hospital kitties that have these like suites set up for them and they can help donate blood that are just, you know, or um, for dogs, you know, people will have a routine that they'll bring a dog in every, you know, a few times a year and be able to donate some blood. So it's great. It's a great way to help them have your pet be a, a, a hero as a lot of yeah. people say it. There's, and there's, so there's not a ton of blood donation sites that are community donations, um, but you can find them, you know, in the area, various areas. I think uh, a lot of universities have these blood mobiles that go around to the community, usually have, again, requirements that they have to meet. They'll usually pay for all of the testing for your pet. Um, and sometimes there'll be some sort of an incentive. Maybe, yeah. you know, they provide uh, free wellness care for your pet you know, if your pet is a blood donor and donates a certain number of times a year, but every place is going to be a little different. Um, most of the blood that we get is from blood banks, which yes. is like you said, it's right. like a colony, well-kept colony of dogs right. that their only job is every six weeks they donate some blood. And otherwise they're, you know, happy, healthy little animals, um, cats or dogs. Right. Yeah, and the, honestly, like the the clinic cats that we had, we had clinic cats at vet school that donated blood. They were like they lived the life. I tell you, they had a whole like wing to themselves, and they were really fun. And and they, people, go, so in those situations, I'm sure you had that the yes. vet students would be like, "I need some stress relief. I'm going to go to the cat colony and oh, just they, chill." Like right? yeah, they were great. They were yeah. absolutely wonderful. And I mean, these are cats that otherwise would have either been put down or in the shelter or whatever. So they're it's great to kind of give they them a second homes, chance yeah. and, and give them a, give them a home. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, no long-term ill effects for, for donating blood um, for your dog, but that was a great question. Um, so as far as cat bloods go, we sort of went over the typing. Mm -hmm. um, dogs also have typing, but their typing is like really a little bit more, you know, um, intricate, Yeah, I guess. There's just a ton of different blood types in dogs, and but we really only care about one or two of them. Right. So 1.1. Um, that's yeah. the blood type. It's super weird. weird. <laughs> 1.1 1. positive. Yeah. yeah. DEA 1.1 positive or negative is the big thing we look for. And Dogs it, have this different scenario where you can actually give them one transfusion of whatever blood type you have. doesn't matter. And they will be fine. If they ever have a blood transfusion, you need to type them. So every transfusion in the future you, you always have them. to type and cross match them yep. and that means you're taking little bits of the patient blood little bits of the donor blood and making sure that it doesn't react and it's quite interesting to do you can actually basically when you when you're doing this experiment you're basically seeing outside of the dog's body 
how are those blood cells going to interact together? Yeah. And you can see if they start clumping up and forming all this stuff, ooh, this is not going to go well. Because you know that's going to happen the inside the body. That same thing, all of those red cells and all of those factors are all going to congeal inside of their body. And that's, that's a transfusion reaction, which can kill an animal. Right. Um, so it is, it's very important to do that cross-matching yes. if they've ever received that transfusion afterwards. And yeah, the, the DEA, the dog erythrocyte antigen 1.1, negative, positive, it's weird because I feel like people always think of A, B and kind of like how cats are, you know, or humans, um, yeah. or humans. Yeah. Um, I should say <laughs> more humans. Um, but it is the same concept, right? So that, you know, you do, you do get concerned anytime that you're giving something foreign to an animal, a person, whatever, that they just, you don't want them to have a reaction and there's no a hundred percent foolproof way of determining if they're going to react or not. Um, it's just as based on percentage wise of what the, you know, how we sort of expect these patients to, to react once they receive blood. Yeah. So when we give transfusions, we typically, even if we, if we don't know the status of the patient, whether it's had a transfusion before or not, we generally don't risk it. We still type them and cross match them unless yes. there's, you know, huge financial concerns or that kind of thing. Um, and then when we give the transfusions, we have a protocol that we give them in a certain way with certain types of filters, and we give them slowly and watch to see if they're having a reaction because they will um, display certain telltale things like elevated heart rate, elevated temperature, redness, hives sometimes, and then we can know that we have to stop the transfusion and right. treat them for that, and that blood unit is not going to work. Right. Right. Um, and as far as reasons why we give transfusions, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why it's not always just because a patient has had a tra traumatic is event bleeding, and right. is bleeding. So, um, there are a lot of different reasons why we give transfusions and that can kind of change our overall outcome too, as well. Um, you know, typically a dog that, you know, has an acute bleed or a cat that has an acute bleed, those patients tend to do okay with blood transfusions because their body just lost blood and we just need to replace it. Whereas some other reasons why we need to give transfusions, like let's say they're having an immune mediated reaction against their mm -hmm. blood cells. Um, if the own, if the dog or cat's own immune system is attacking its own red blood cells, the chances that we are giving more red blood cells to try to help that animal out. The chance of that animal having a reaction to our blood cells that we're giving is 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 higher. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the reason, I mean, any the, ultimately the reason that you're giving a transfusion, and we should say that there are different way different types of transfusions. You can give whole blood. That's whole blood, right? All the blood. You can give red cells. You can give just the plasma, which is not the red cells. It's the fluidy part of the blood. So usually when we give blood, we're not giving whole blood because we're not, the only way to do that is to get it directly from an animal and give it directly to the patient. All of the blood that we get is pulled out into different components, but you're generally giving it to treat the thing that you're missing, right? So you are missing red blood cells, right? Your hematocrit so you're hematocrit or you're anemic, yeah. right? So then you're adding in red blood cells and that's the most common kind of transfusion. I guess we give plasma transfusions We do give plasma frequently. quite frequently, yeah. Um, but you're ultimately the reason is you've got low red blood cells for whatever reason. But the reason then, like if you give, if you have a bleeding patient, but you do nothing to stop the bleeding and you just run a transfusion, well, you haven't fixed anything. That blood that you just gave is going to pour right out, right? Yeah. So you have to fix the problem. Right. With the immune issues though, it, it, it's like you're trying to fix the problem, but you have to wait. So, so we, we say they're like eating their red, they're chewing through their right. red blood cells. They eat those transfusions just as quickly as they were eating their own but you bought you bought them some time yeah and then gives the body time to stop that reaction to calm down and then you may need to give them multiple transfusions to get them through that event mm -hmm. yeah. just depends on the severity yeah um what else about blood transfusions Do you have any questions no no other questions it's yeah Hopefully it's we're, something we're that we do. Though. I would say that we do it as far as transfusing patients. I mean, we do it on a fairly consistent basis. It's yep. not something that is so rarely done. So I do think that people necessarily don't always have it in the front of their mind because, you know, with human blood donations, I feel like, you know, there's always seeing the red cross and they need donations with veterinary medicine. You know, we don't frequently reach out to the public for blood drives, right. you know, so that's probably why it's not on their mind, but we will still give blood transfusions. Um, that they're still definitely needed in veterinary mm -hmm. medicine. It just isn't that we're reaching out to the public as much. And some of our sister hospitals, they do have their blood banks and they do events and stuff where they, they mm -hmm. reach out across the country. Yeah. yeah. So our, one of our sister hospitals, like Denver has a, yep. um, yep. a Wheat Ridge. Wheat Ridge, yeah. How so often will they do it? Will they do it a couple times a year? I, I think so. I don't know how exactly yeah. how many, but they do quite a bit of events. And mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, they have a good group of donors. They call them heroes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, interesting little tidbit in exotics, we always have the issue that there aren't really blood banks for ferrets Ferrets, or uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Someone out there is probably screaming like I have a ferret blood bank, but in general, we can't get blood for these species. There used to be a product out on the market that was like a simulator, a red blood cell simulator that you give to any patient that unfortunately went off the market. So the only way that we can give transfusions usually now in these small little whatevers is if the owner happens to have an otherwise healthy ferret or guinea pig or whatever. I don't, I've never done a guinea pig, but ferrets. No, yeah, the ferret uh, especially is, is if you have like, say, owners of one ferret usually have five ferrets, you know, and so one of those healthy pets can give a donation for their sister or. We even sibling. had some technicians that have actually had their own ferrets help donate, donate blood. some blood right. here, and uh, in those cases, you're still just drawing a small amount, but you're only giving it to a small patient, so it's true, a very appropriate amount. Yeah, to yeah. draw. 